is alive. To wake to the sound of birdsong, know that it is Saturday morning, and have that wonderful feeling of relief flooding all over me. Oh, I think I'll lie here all day. Oh, oh, oh. Lie here and let my sleep-drugged brain bask like a whale luxuriating in the deep water of the... Holy mackerel! It's Monday! Bristow by Frank Dickens with Michael Williams as Bristow, Rodney Buse as Jones and Dora Bryan as Mrs Purdy. The Girl Next Door. What's it like working as a buying clerk at Chester Perry's? Have you ever had a tooth pulled without an anaesthetic? Have you ever tumbled down a mountainside, striking rocks and boulders as you fell? and sustained sharp cuts and serious bruising? Have you ever had wedges of wood hammered under your fingernails? That's what it's like working at Chester Perry's. Up until tea break. Then it gets progressively worse. Bristow! Morning. I'm only joking, of course. It's not a bad firm, really. And let's face it, the management are pretty free and easy. We can come in any time before nine and leave any time after five. But I've got them where I want them. Because I'm writing an expose on big business to warn children about the sort of problems they face when they leave school to join the rat race. For example, a lot of young people who start their first job take it too seriously. They take their work home with them. Wrong! You've got to learn to close the door behind you. It takes time to realise this doesn't happen overnight. And you're forever learning. Let's take a look at last week from the top. Good morning, Station Master. Mm. It's a funny thing. I was thinking about you the other day. Mm? Strange, isn't it? That if I were to meet you somewhere else and you were out of uniform, I probably wouldn't recognise you. Even though I've seen you every working day for the past seven years. That is a total of 1,355 times. Don't you find that strange? I do indeed, sir, but considering you've said exactly the same thing to me on each and every one of the 1,355 occasions to which you refer, I find it not only strange, but positively weird. And now, if you'll excuse me, I have a station to run. <whistles> you run it, do you? Trains are still on the agenda. The thing that Stevenson had in mind all those years ago. Getting people from A to B. You still do that sort of thing? It's actually run. You surprised me. I didn't realise it was run. I've always thought it was frozen in time. There it is. The Chester Perry Building, a miracle of modern construction. It took an army of workmen two years to build that place. Just give me a pickaxe, 24 hours, and a demolition order. Wrong kind of music for a start. Ought to be something like the Death March. There's just more like it. I've only been in the building 25 seconds, and already it's fed up to the back teeth time. Stand aside, Jones. Any place I hang my hat is open. Uh, don't, Bristow. The window's open. Oh, too late. 
It'll have landed in the gutter. Windows are not supposed to be open until June the 3rd. I say, look at this, Jones. Bristow, come away. Somebody might see you. Jones, there's a new girl in the office across the street. Don't be ridiculous. You're only saying that to get me to... Good heavens. Wowie, how about that? Steady on. You're drooling all over the windowsill. Oh, is my tie straight? I should have worn my best suit. Jones, you're a married man. Uh, uh, what makes you say that? You mean you're not? I'm not saying I'm not. What makes you say I am? Well, I always assumed that. I haven't really given the matter, really. When a crowd of us came round to your place to play cards that night, you turned someone's photograph to the wall. That doesn't mean I'm married. Could have been anyone. Could have been my mother. Could have been a relative. Which photograph was it? I don't know. You turned it to face the wall the minute the cards came out. Here, let me think of it. Someone with glasses. Lots of people have got glasses. Oh, isn't she a beaut? Just calm down. Stand back. Let me close the window. Leave the window alone. I want it open. All right. I'd never heard that note in Jones's voice before. He sounded almost human for a second, and it set me thinking. Although we'd been working in the same office for seven years, we never really knew much about each other. We were still comparative strangers, touch wood, and the only thing we had in common was the job. I decided, and this is where I made my first mistake, take heed, young wannabe, to get to know more about him. Isn't it funny? Our other offices all seem much better than your own. That place over there seemed almost friendly. Sort of place you can walk into without that knife between the shoulder blades feeling you get when you walk in here. Oh, and look at those flowers. How long since you've seen flowers in an office? Her eyes are the blue of the dainty cornflower. Mm. Her dress the hue of the nodding violet. Her lips the colour of the wild rose. Keep your voice down or we'll have fudge coming out. Crimson, the colour of his angry face. Yellow, the streak that runs down our backs. But look at those cakes. Why don't we get cakes like that? Jam donuts, cream slices, coconut macaroons, and cherry tarts. Curses! There goes the one I fancy. Come away from the window, Jones. People will be starting to talk. Bristow, it's not what you're thinking. I'm standing here because it's interesting. What do you think all those people do out there? Why aren't they stuck in a stuffy office like us? How come they're all walking the streets when we are chained to our desks? Oh, isn't it obvious? They are millionaire playboys. They can't all be millionaire playboys. Not all of them. Most of them. The others are lottery winners buying furniture. Hello. There's Sir Reginald Chester Perry's car pulling up outside. And our beloved firm's foundry is being set down. My word. He has aged... His face is lined with worry. Worry? Think of multi-millionaire business tycoon worries. Those are laughter lines. That means the canteen will be laying on something special today. Shall we eat there? Not likely. They put the prices up when he's here. You mean you're barred again? Barred? Who's barred? <clears throat> canteen, what gastronomic feast are you offering today? My name is Bristow. B-R-I-S-T-O-W. B for braised beef, R for rabbit pie, I for Irish stew, S for sausage, T for toad, as in toad in the old, and W for Vienna schnitzel. I'd like to know what's on the menu today. <laughs> How dare you! And the same to you with knobs of butter on. Damn salt. So it's the park. Did you bring sandwiches? No. We can always eat berries. We've done it before, when we had the trouble with the accounts department. Ah, but that was in the winter, when there were berries about. Mm. Hold it. Problem solved. It's raining out there. It can't be. With sunshine a minute ago. Is there a rainbow? Sure is. Come on, let me see that. Hmm. There's supposed to be a crock of gold where the rainbow ends. Good heavens, it's true. It finishes up outside accounts. Ah, canteen it is. If you can get in, that is. Ah, I can get in if I really want to. Just means I have to wear a mask. I'll make one out of these invoices.
Bristow, we must be stupid eating in the firm's canteen. Mm. We are just giving them back the money we work for. In fact, they make a profit out of us. A chef like Mr. Gordon Blue doesn't come cheap. And the fact that he can experiment with the food the way he does leaves a nasty taste in the mouth every day. Can I take your order? Oh, hello, Mr. Jones. Long time no see. Hello, Mrs. Buxton. The truth is we've been eating in the park of late, but now the weather has changed, we've decided to come back here. Return of the prodigal, as it were. <laughs> Fatted calves off. Oh, what have you got? Tender chunks of specially selected Scottish beef cooked in rich, thick gravy in golden, feather-like pastry, accompanied by crisp, golden French fried potatoes. Meat pie and chips twice. I like the new crockery. So elegant. Willow pattern, isn't it? Sort of. The picture tells the story anyway. Two employees sneaking out over a humpback bridge with Sir Reginald in hot pursuit. And I like the way the knives and forks are chained to the side of the plates. Where do the Miles and Rudge people go for lunch? Oh, forget it, Jones. A look like her probably goes to a Swiss restaurant with one of the directors. Shan't be a moment. Yet, for heaven's sake, sit down. You're making an exhibition of yourself. Next morning, I got in early. I could tell the cleaning ladies had been hard at work. My seat was still warm and the end of my pencil had been chewed. Jones was standing by the window. What's the matter? Couldn't you sleep? I was just watching the world out there come to life, as it were. A kaleidoscope of colour and movement. Milkmen making their deliveries, postmen hurrying from door to door with their heavy sacks. The comings and goings of the cleaning staff, late night revellers making their way home. Fascinating, wonderful, inspiring. Brings out the poet in me. And doesn't she, though? Uh, it's Fudgin. Oh, he's in all right, and already had a go at Hewitt. He asked Hewitt to do something, and Hewitt answered back. <coughs> Hewitt answered back? Well, he didn't exactly answer back. He just didn't say yes, sir, quick enough. Fatal. Where the devil is Mrs. Purdy, the tea lady? Ah, methinks I hear her Winnebago, e'en as we speak. Mm. Tea up. Wet and warm and plenty of hard bake. Morning, Mr. Jones. Lovely day. Oh, is it? I wouldn't know. Weather to me is just something on the other side of the window. Talking of windows, and look at that. There's a new girl working across the road. Suit you all right, eh, Mr. Jones? <laughs> <laughs> Morning, Mrs. Paddy. What comestibles have you on board today? Oh, get you. Comestibles, eh? Oh, swallowed a dictionary, have you? Uh, do you have any of your homemade lighters of feather fairy cakes? Uh, I thought you didn't like my homemade lighters of Heather Fairy Games. What are you talking about? Finest paperweights in the business. Your coconut macaroons look nice. Ah, oh, nice. Mm, I think I'll take one of those. How much are they? 25p. 25p? Sorry, Mr Bristow, the price of coconut's gone up. Revolution in the country or something. Isn't it marvellous? Every single solitary action, man-made or otherwise, far or near, that happens on the face of this earth, hits me in the pocket. I'll have a nice cup of hot tea. You'll have it like the rest of us, served at room temperature. I'll have a weakest star geeling with a sliver of lemon, a whisper of sugar, served in a white china cup, shaken, not stirred. Coming up. Stand back. <laughs> Holy mackerel. How long have you been here, Mrs Purdy? Twelve years. Yes. No. Twelve years, man and boy. And how many cups of succulent tea have you served up in that time? Thousands. Hundreds of thousands. What's the secret? Trial and error. Stand back! I'm soaked. Pass me one of those invoices, Jones. Tea doesn't stain, does it? Mrs. Purdy's does. She puts something in it specially. Good morning, Mr. Bristow. Good morning, Mr. Jones. Good morning, Mrs. Purdy. Oh, look. There's a new girl started in the office across the road. So you, Mr. Jones. <laughs> we'll have no time for the girls here now. Hmm, nice dress. I wonder where she got that from. Marks and Spencer's are doing them. My daughter's got one exactly the same. Uh, ladies, please, you are at work. She won't be there long. What makes you say that? She's too attractive. Lookers never last long. They join a firm, they cause a lot of trouble and leave. My daughter does it all the time. Takes after her mother, does she? <laughs> <laughs> As you can tell, 
Jones is suddenly on top of his form. It's that girl over there has got him going. We won't get any more work from him today. On the Wednesday, I arrived to find Miss Sunman and Jones both standing by the window. She's not all that attractive. I don't know. I don't know, really, I don't. Look at all the men round her. I wish she worked here. Oh, Mr Jones, you're a married man. Who told you that? Uh, Mr Bristow said hmm? that when he came round to play cards at your place... I know, I know. He saw me turn a photograph to the wall. With glasses. I know all about the glasses. I'm <laughs> sick of hearing about the glasses. How many more people are you going to tell? Mm. I'm surprised you haven't got anything better to do. <coughs> Mr Bristow... I wonder whether you'd mind listening to some of your dictation. I can't make head nor tail of it. Fire away. <clears throat> Read your letter of the 14th. What a lot of nonsense. What rubbish. What drivel. What a waste of time, money and materials. What a shambles. What rot. What bunk and what piffle. What does it mean, Mr Bristow? It means I left the machine on when I was skimming through the bumper spring number of the house journal. Oh, but that was the golden anniversary number. 200 issues. I think it's marvellous. Marvellous? I think it's incredible. Considering each issue is worse than the last, I'd say it's a downright miracle. You're only saying that because your name wasn't in it. That's the only way they get people to read it, by filling it with names. After all, it's a human weakness to want to see your name in print. Personally, I think anyone who's never been mentioned ought to go down in the firm's roll of honour. If you feel like that, <laughs> why are you carrying a copy in your pocket? For your information, I'm going to lunch in the park. And judging by the amount of rain that fell during the night, the seat may be damp. Assuming I can sort out this letter, how many copies do you want? Six, please. Six? You want six Miss copies? Miss Sunman, I hate repeating myself. Right you are, Mr Bristow. Yes? Uh, get me Mr Williams of Davis Piers. What do we say? Uh, Mary, don't mess about Mr Williams, please. the line, please. Hello? Mr Williams, please. Hold the line. Hello? Mr Williams? Oh, no, they put you through the wrong office by mistake. Hold oh. the line. Hello? You put me through to the wrong... Hello? Hello? Miss? Miss? <sighs> Mary, dear, could you please get the new line management? This is Hugh line management. If you know the extension you want, please press it now. Mm -mm. Alternatively, follow these instructions. Mm. For production, press 1. For finance, press 2. For development, press 3. Oh. For publicity, press 4. Oh. For transport, press 5. Mm -hmm. For general purposes... Press six. Yeah, gotcha. Six it is. Please hold the line. <laughs> Welcome to Hugh Line Management General Purposes. If you have an inquiry on general services, oh. press one. If you have an inquiry on specific purpose, press two. Gotcha. Two it is. Welcome <laughs> to specific purposes. Hold the line, please. If you wish to speak to Jonathan Cheveley, press one. If you wish to speak to Freddie Pilkington, press two. Alternatively, uh. hold the line. <coughs> Hello? Hello? Uh. Letter to Mrs. Kerwin and Company. Dear Sirs, our order number DB392 was urged by us on the 20th Ultimo, but no reply has been received. Perhaps you will have the courtesy to answer this time, you lazy good-for-nothing pig. P.S. If a reply has been sent in the last seven days, kindly disregard this letter. Afternoon, postboy. Cheer up. It's not the end of the world. It might just as well be. Hmm? What a pathetic life we lead, Mr Bristow. There are so many things I should have seen and done instead of being stuck in a building like this. I've never seen the pyramids, the Acropolis, the Sugarloaf Mountain, the Niagara Falls, the Taj Mahal by moonlight. That's nothing. I've never seen the office clock with the big hand on the twelve and the small hand on the five. Any mail for me? Postcard from Miss Cleave. On holiday in the Austrian Alps. Mm. Having a wonderful time in this fairy tale village. Fleecy clouds dance happily around the snow-capped mountain tops, covered in little Christmas trees, and everyone is very friendly. 
Yesterday I had my bottom pinched by a lonely goat herd. Do you see what I mean? Everyone is having fun except me. Mr Bristow, I'm looking for fun, games and excitement. So am I. But it's so long since I've had any, I doubt whether I'd recognise fun, games and excitement if I saw them. For the rest of the day, Jones was strangely quiet, and I took advantage of this to put in a solid afternoon's work. Yes? Mary, get me my opposite number at Gun and Famed. Say please. Mary, we've had this before. Don't mess about. Please, Mary. Please, Mary, dear. Mary, I'm in a hurry. Please, Mary, dear. Who do you want? My opposite number, I've already told you. Hold on. Gun and Fames, T-Boy speaking. This is the Chester Perry Company. I'd like to speak to someone about an order of ours. Uh, Troublemaker, eh? Hold on, I'll put you through. Hello? This is Bristow. Hold on. Turn it down, lads. Hello? Is anyone there? (laughs) This is Bristow of Chester Perry. Hang on, I can't hear a thing. Make a little less noise with those teacups, lads. Who at Chester Perry's? Bristow, B-R-I-S-T-O-W. B for Benjamin, R for Roger, I for Ivor, S for Stanley, T for Tommy, O for Oliver, W for William. And my Christian names are... Is there something wrong with this line? Oh, sorry about that. A couple of lads playing ping-pong with a cracked ball. Cut it out, lads. Uh, Mr Bristow, you said, what can I do for you? It's about an order of ours we placed seven months ago. No, as long as that. Yeah. I don't think it is, you know. It, it, It certainly is. Hang on. George, what was the date on that paper aeroplane Fred was throwing about the other day? Was it? I've a chap here asking about it. What do you want me to tell him? He won't go for that. But I'll stall. Uh, Mr Bisto, yeah. you'll have to call back later. Yeah, but, but, but that's... Oh. If I had to draw a circle around a moment in time and say this is the most boring moment in my life, I would draw that circle now. <laughs> and I would draw another one now. And now. And now. Mr. Stowe, <clears throat> deal with this. <laughs> yes, Mr. Fudge. Certainly, Mr. Fudge. Right away, Mr. Fudge. The, who opened that window? It was warm in here. I don't want this window open. And keep it closed, you hear? Your behaviour of late leaves a lot to be desired, and unless you pull yourself together, you'll find yourself looking for another job. You lazy, indolent, bungling! Can you ring back? I'm in conference. You were saying, Mr. Fudge? What's the matter with you? Toothache? No, Mr. Fudge. I strain! No, Mr. Fudge. Toothache and I strain indeed. That man's a fool. I've been giving him the same look for seven years and he still doesn't recognise dumb insolence. There's no happy medium in this job. He either ignores me or goes berserk. <sighs> when I'm not on the shelf, I'm on the carpet. Oh, Jones! The very oh. man. Order number... Who closed the window? Uh, Fudge did. I want it open. That's down to you. Nothing to do with me. If Fudge asks... If Fudge asks, I opened it. OK? I couldn't understand it. This was not the yes, sir, no, sir, three bags full, sir, character I'd known all these years. This was a fistful of dollars fighting man. And for what? For a girl in the office across the street who he didn't know. On the Friday, things came to a head. Morning, Bristol. Well, well, Samson of Sales. What are you doing in this neck of the woods? Come to see the girl, haven't I? Where is she? Oh, stand by, Jonesy. Let's have a look. Wow. How about that? That is very tasty indeed. Yes, sir. Oh. Hello, Mr. Bristow. Morning, Miss Peach. What can I do for you? Uh, I, uh, now, let me see. You've um, come to take a look at the girl across the street, haven't you? I want to see the dress. Excuse me. Yeah, oh, Miss Peach. Stand yeah. back, Samson. Let the girl have a look. I like yeah. the sleeves, but the neck's wrong with that hairstyle. It's all silly. She's gorgeous. Move on. This is getting out of hand. They'll be selling tickets soon. Morning, Bristow. Morning, Dukins. It's a long time no see. Oh, I'm not often this way, but this morning I happen to be passing. The window's over there. Thank you. The trouble with offices is that news spreads like wildfire. 
You say something to someone, and words spread around in however long it takes Jones to walk round the building. Hello, Mr. Bain. Uh, Connie from invoicing. Come in, window. Oh, thank you. I'm just interested in the hairstyle. <laughs> Buying department, Bristow. Hello, Steve. What? Yes, you want to come up? Feel free. I warn you, there's quite a little crowd. Hello, Bristow. Hang on. Hello, Bill. Window. Uh, sorry, it's getting a trifle chaotic. Uh, see you in a minute. Bristow, sorry to trouble you. Could we just move your desk back a bit and give us a bit more room? Well, it's a bit... I'm, I'm trying to do some work. You don't have to move, Dinkins. Grab that end, eh? Yes. That's it. Oh, keep still, Bristow. Really? Oh, window! <laughs> No, no, you can't. Who is it? You'll have to speak up, I can't hear. Who? God, still can't. You'll have to ring back. I said ring back later. I don't know how long this would have gone on for, but at its height, Fudge's door opened and... What the devil? Bristol? Jones? My office at once. I will draw a veil over the scene that followed. Sufficient to say that when I got home that evening, my head was still ringing. I decided to have an early night. As I was going up the stairs to my room, I was joined by my landlady's husband, Bert Hawkins. Ah, oh, Mr Bristow. Oh, Mr Hawkins. Uh, Mrs Hawkins was telling me you've had trouble with your sesh cord. Mm. Mind if I come and say hello? No, not at all. You're welcome. Would you like me to explain? Oh, that won't be necessary, Mr. B. I know my way around. Yes, these things have a habit of jamming up every now... Oh, I say. Mr. Bristow, come over and look at this. Hmm? Look, the flat across the road. The girl unpacking. Looks as if she's just moving in. Bit of all right, eh? And I'm a married man. Oh. I couldn't believe it. The same girl. Holy mackerel. Now I'm bringing my work home. Bristow was written by Frank Dickens and featured Michael Williams as Bristow Rodney Bewes as Jones, Dora Bryan as Mrs Purdy, John Glover as Fudge, the Station Master, Samson and Hawkins, Katie Odie as Miss Sunman and Mary, Simon Schatzberger as the Postboy and Dimkins, and Carol Starks as Miss Peach, Janet and Mrs Buxton. The music was composed and performed by John Whitehall. The sound recording was by Graham Harper. The director, Neil Cargill.